see if it works this time. All right, we are live now. Well, I'll just uh, say, hey, everybody, yeah, we're live. Welcome to uh, episode 435. We had some issues, some technical issues uh, with comments and a bunch of stuff on YouTube. So we're starting this over. So if you're watching live, hopefully you're, uh, you're back to join us. If you're not watching live, you ne will never have known that this happened, but now you do. Uh, so we're just going to get this fired up in the background um, and then uh, check things. So if you want, fast forward a little bit and we'll get into it uh, I'm going to, what can we do? I need to like do a chat GPT summary of like, what did we do? Get it transcribed real quick and, and share the summary. But let's see, Chris, you were out snowboarding last week. Yeah. <laughs> Hitting the gym. Things are going good. Uh, Bradley's been busy. Uh, Adam's been dealing with snow and then got out for a run. So that brings everybody up to uh, where they should be. So Bradley, what are you seeing on your end? Do things look good? No, it's still... It's still looking funky. This has probably got something to do with the Zoom update that Chris was just talking about before we started the webinar today. So anyway, whatever. Well, yeah, I it guess is what it is. Have to roll with it. And I guess uh, people are watching live. Maybe if you can go to the if you can comment, that's great. I know Michael was able to comment. I guess uh, it's kind of working. Not sure what's going on there. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Melissa's well, roll with it. I, I got pre posted questions we can answer if nothing else. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, I'm going to say we already got it. Uh, in case you're watching the replay, uh, we were talking about local PBN command. Uh, the local PBN uh, course that Bradley put together, uh, we'll have that uh, put up separately. A um, couple other announcements I wanted to make. Um, if you have not seen it yet, chat or GPT-4 was released. Um, there's a developer live stream showing some examples of how it was used, which I found personally interesting. And I think anybody doing anything online with content uh, we'll find it interesting as well. So I'll post the link in the chat, assuming that I can actually post a link in the chat. Uh, highly suggest you check that out. The other thing I wanted to say, had some questions earlier today in the Facebook group. Uh, somebody was asking if mastermind members get access to the local PBN yes. training. Yes, yes, they do. It is included. They get it for free as being part of the mastermind. Um, so if you're interested in finding out about that, finding out more about the mastermind, you're doing local SEO as a consultant, as an agency owner, um, you can find out more at mastermind.semanticmastery.com. Would love to have you come join us if that is what you're doing and you want to really take your uh, agency or consulting up to the next level. All right. Uh, that's it on my end. Anything else we need to talk about, guys? I see some comments rolling in. So apparently it's finally working now. Thank hey, God. look at that. All right. It's working. All right. All right. Well, the gremlins got us briefly, but it looks like it's working now. So, um, all right. What else do we got before we jump uh, in? I got one more. I wanted to uh, say real quick. I forgot. Uh, Pofu Live. Um, we were talking about this literally yesterday. We've been making some decisions on where we're going to be. Um, and we what tell it's them where? Look like this year. What's that? Can we tell them where? No. Oh, yeah. Go for it. Boston. Woo! Boston, Mass. So Never been be up in my neck of the woods. Uh, Bradley's going to be able to get there easily. And uh, Chris is going to have to take a long flight. But Chris has to take a long flight no matter where Pofu Live is. <laughs> uh, Boston. I, I, what is this? Uh, your, your cousin from Boston. You know what I'm talking about? That beer commercial? No. What beer oh, is I it? I can't now? remember. What it is. He's, your cousin from, Bo from Boston. Boston. <laughs> uh, that's cool. It's going to be a good one. So we're starting to get things together, flesh it out. Um, we will have uh, tickets probably up around uh, May is what I'm aiming for. Um, as usual, there will definitely be an early bird uh, deal for that. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, make sure you're on the email list, Facebook group, whatever it is. Um, we it, we love it uh, when people get early bird tickets for two reasons. Like one, you know, it's good to see the enthusiasm, but it helps us with planning. Um, and then on your end, it really helps because you get a hell of a deal. Um, you save a bundle by getting one of the early bird tickets. So it will be in September. Uh, let me pull up the calendar. I believe it is September 29th and 30th over that weekend there, the last weekend in September in Boston. So put that on your calendars, pencil it in, keep your eyes out, eyes and ears open for uh, ticket sales. When that happens, it should be going on a sale in early May. Cool. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Let's uh, jump into the pre-posted questions. All right. Well, I'm going to do a little pitch here first. If that's we're done with the PBN stuff? No, that's why I'm going to do a little pitch here first. Oh, all right. Go for it. I thought we, we had that. I'm going to get that video, but we'll go back and do it again. Yeah, we'll go Round back two. and do a little bit more yeah. with some resources, visual aids and shit like that. So, all right, let me grab the screen real quick. Uh, this won't take long, but um, 
I do want to share this briefly. So <clears throat> this, all right. So here's what it looks like. I'll give you guys a quick rundown um, of what the process, what it, what it really, what this entails. This is the inside of our new mastermind member area, which is on the circle platform. It's really nice. It's got all these different discussion groups and everything, but specifically the local PBN building or local PBN command is the internet marketing name that Adam assigned to it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but this is, this is the SOP or training. It's, there are part sections that are actually like SOPs where, uh, where there's also written instructions, but most of it is just kind of video instruction, but <clears throat> very, very thorough. And this is essentially what the process is here, local PBN, geographic links for local SEO. This is what I was talking about a moment ago when we, on the first kind of attempt at the live stream today, uh, or hump the hangouts today. I mentioned it that I had kind of discovered last year that topically relevant or topical relevance, topically relevant links have a significant effect or impact on organic ranking for local projects and a slight influence on maps ranking. But what I had noticed was through analyzing literally hundreds and hundreds of competitor backlink profiles for uh, hundreds of keywords and finding that you know, typically organic ranked, the top organic ranked competitors generally have links, link profiles. And I say generally because there's always anomalies, but generally have link profiles in the appropriate topical categories. And so that's one of the ways that I kind of determined that that is a significant um, ranking factor. Uh, but what I noticed was oftentimes the top ranked competitors in the maps pack. So the three the, in the three pack generally have, uh, uh, sometimes there would be a, a competitor that, or, you know, a, a business that was ranked in both the three packs and an organic. But all, a lot of the times you see differences, right? You see organic rank competitors and then you'll see maps rank. And there's oftentimes not a correlation between both. And so I started analyzing the backlink profiles of those ranking in the maps pack. And what I started to rec what I started to see was over time was kind of a trend emerge, which was, or a pattern, whatever, in that most of the top ranked competitors and or businesses in the three pack would oftentimes we'd be able to find in their backlink profile, even if they had very few backlinks or a very poor um, topical, like their backlink profile wasn't topically relevant. And oftentimes in the maps three pack, you will find businesses that have shit relevance, like their, their backlink profile is not relevant at all as far as topically, but geographically it's relevant. In other words, they'll have backlinks pointing from other local businesses in the same geographic area in uh, the same general physical location or area, if that makes sense. And so um, after seeing that over and over and over again, I decided to start testing it. So I started trying to find ways to secure links from local sources. Um, there's a number of ways you can do it, kind of the more traditional approach, which is outreach. You can do sponsorships of uh, little league teams, parks and recs teams, schools, um, charities. You can do uh, no, local news and events, uh, media and event sites, you can get links from them. You can do local link exchanges from uh, like lead share groups. Um, off, you know, you can you can go to meetup.com or BNI groups and things like that and do link exchanges with other businesses in the same general area. Um, there's a number of local chamber of commerce is a great link to get if you can get it. If like if you join a local or your clients join local chamber of commerce, they get a link from that. That's often a very, very powerful link for ranking in maps. So what I found was, like I said, a lot of local uh, links with local relevance or geographic relevance, and that has a significant influence on maps with a slight influence on organic. So really the sweet spot is that overlap in the middle is if you can get links from both uh, topically and geographically relevant sources. So anyway, when I kind of discovered the geographic links was a significant ranking factor for maps, uh, I started wanting to test that. The traditional approach, as I just mentioned, is very difficult to scale to, to get links from local sources. So I kind of started testing and trying to find ways to find domains that have expired that um, have you know local backlinks already pointing to them. So using the same method that I used to hunt down topically relevant links, I just had to change my hunting strategy a bit to determine to to find domains with local relevance, geographic relevance, topical relevance doesn't matter from those, except if you can get a, a domain that is both topically relevant and geographically relevant. By far, that's the best kind of uh, domain that you can pick up, the best kind of backlink you can build. Uh, but I don't actually look for for that. I just look for when I'm looking or hunting down 
uh, geographically or locally relevant domains. I'm looking just for local relevance. And sometimes throughout that kind of process of, of um, analyzing potential domains, I will find some that are also, it's kind of rare, but also topically relevant. And so those are hands down the best kind to get. But that said, I'm just trying to show you guys like there's some, you know, some uh, examples here of backlinks or that are, are coming from local sources. You can see this. Now, this was the presentation I gave at SEO at the beach. So some of you might have already seen this, but uh, I'm going through this just because this is kind of explains what it is that the local PBN command training is, a, is about. All right. And it, this is just a, a slight pitch, guys, so you understand what the method is. You could probably go figure this out on your own. Um but you could buy the course from me and figure out or from us and figure out uh, and, and and basically you could plug a VA into it and have a VA do it, which, by the way, I've got somebody trained now to do this for me. So and it only took about two weeks uh, for him to get fully trained on this. Um, so anyway, you can see like here's a chamber of commerce, another chamber of commerce, another chamber of commerce, city of uh, city of dot com, uh, Houston dot org, Heights Chamber. Uh, there's a local newspaper domain. So these are all the kind of stuff that I see oftentimes, like longbranchpool.com. This is this is one of my biggest tree service competitors in one of the cities that I've never, I went, I'm not going to say never, I've been fighting this one tree service contractor in this one city in Virginia for 10 years. Uh, well, since 2000, at least eight years. I've been fighting this guy for this other company for eight years, and they're always number one in maps. I, very rarely over the last eight years, I've passed them and, and pushed them to number two, but it's only been brief. I've, it's never stuck. They are always, always, always in the number one position, and it pisses me off <laughs> because I've never been able to overtake them permanently. It's very temporarily I've been able to overtake them, but what they've got, they've been a well-established company, been around for a long time, and they've got a ton of local backlinks a ton of local backlinks. And so that's one of the reasons why they rank so well. But this JL Tree Service, that's what I'm talking about. You can see like all these different local links here. So this is what I'm talking about, guys. These types of links have a significant effect on maps ranking. And so I figured out a way to do it. Um, and again, it's just using the, the same method that I use for topically relevant links. I just had to change my kind of strategy or uh, my approach a little bit in order to get it. And then obviously the build outs for the for the sites to uh, either you can build blogs or you can build single HTMLs, what I call rebuilds. You can do a number of different types of um, site builds on the domains that you perk that you find that have local relevance. Okay. So uh, the method, again, I'm not going to go through all this guys, because that's not what this is not a, a webinar to pitch this. It's just, I just wanted to go through a brief kind of uh, description of what this product is. So here's the method. You guys can see that. And then um we basically find expired domains with geographic relevance. You analyze the backlink profile, looking for backlinks from other local sources. That's the most important thing. Referring domains matter here. Um, I typically don't care so much about referring domains when I'm looking for domains that have topical relevance. I'm looking for when I'm when I'm trying to find domains with topical relevance, I'm looking for very strong backlinks in the appropriate topical category that are pointing to it. But when looking for locally relevant domains, again, I don't care about the trust flow value. It can be trust flow value zero. That's fine. Makes no difference to me. Topical relevance doesn't really matter, except if I can find a domain that also has topical relevance, then by all means, I want to pick that up. But what matters is for this is referring domains, is finding uh, as many, uh, when analyzing a potential domain, you want to look at the backlink profile and try to determine how, it, you know, I, my, my, my threshold is the, the domain has to have a minimum of at least two referring domains from other local sources or else I won't pick it up. That makes sense. But the, the more, the better. OK, so that's where I found the the, uh, the domains that have more referring domains pointing to them from other local sources. The, the more referring domains from other local sources, the more powerful that domain that backlink will be for maps ranking. Um, hopefully that's clear. So anyway. Um, deploy, develop locally relevant content. There's a number of ways to do that. I have a method that works really well that I really like, which is using CTRFI. And I go through a full process on how to do that specifically with CTRFI in the training. Um, you can deploy the sites with CTRFI or Yaks, which is fabulous as well. Marketingblocks.ai. Um, I've not tested that myself, but that is a, certainly a, 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 a builder that you could use for that. MobiRise is an HTML builder. That works as well. Um, if you want to do it more manually, uh, then you can optimize optimize the site's indexing, target link placement, and tier two links. So that's basically what the course is, guys. 
I go through all the process of how to find the domains, what to look for, how to uh, find geographically relevant domains, how to analyze the backlink profile to look for um, uh, local backlinks, local referring domains, uh, then how to develop locally relevant content. And then I talk about deploying the sites. There's a number of ways to do that. Then there's an optimization process. Then there's an indexing process. Uh, after you know, after we deploy the sites and optimize it, then we go through an indexing process. And then from there, I do the target link placement. Uh, well, sorry, I was on the wrong slide. Here's the indexing process. The target link placement, there's a number of ways to do that. So I, I talk about that very thoroughly as well. And then also the tier two links, some automated tier two linking um, options, which is just a great way to kind of push more power into those local domains. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, th this is like what the training looks like. Again, it's very, very thorough. You can see there's a lot of lessons in here. Um, I actually just added a lesson today, which was this one here. Just today, I added this in. Uh, no. Sorry, let me go back. This one. This is the one that I, my VA, who I trained to do um, these local blog building, had a he was having trouble finding domains for a particular city that I, in Denver, Colorado. Um, and so I, I just recorded a 20 minute video yesterday, or 22 minute, almost 23 minute video yesterday for him, showing him how to expand search criteria to still find locally relevant domains. And um, I sent that to him. And this was a video recorded for my VA for a very particular project that I uh, assigned to him. But then I thought about it. I was like, you know, if he's having that problem, other people probably will too. So therefore, I added that training video um, into the uh, pro the the course today. Excuse me. So that because I think that'll be valuable for those of you that may have trouble finding locally relevant domains when you're looking just for at, at the city level. There's a way to kind of expand search criteria. So anyway, hopefully that makes sense, guys. I didn't want to spend too much time pitching on that, but it's um, very powerful method. It works really well, and I would encourage you to check it out. Yeah, no, that was good, Bradley. A quick uh, question to this, I think, that goes with this. And Selma was asking, would you say that geo-relevant links are more powerful than topical relevant links? Um, it depends on what what type you're right, what 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 you're trying to do. Because remember, this is that this is where this is what matters here, right? So topical relevance has a more significant effect on organic ranking, geographic or locally relevant. Uh, links have a more effect, uh, a greater effect on maps ranking. So you, the, if the question is which one is more powerful, it depends on what are, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve maps ranking? If so, locally relevant links are more powerful. Are you trying to achieve organic ranking? If so, topically relevant links are more powerful. Um, so hopefully that's clear. Cool. Uh, and yes, the PBN Local PBN course is already included in the mastermind, guys. Just about everything that we do is already included in the mastermind. So there you go. Okay. All right, guys, let's get into the pre-posted questions. Not a whole lot, uh, but let's get into them. Since we lost some time this morning or uh, today anyway. <clears throat> so Gordon, what's up, buddy? He says, hey, a few months ago, you mentioned that you have ranked blogger sites on the first page very quickly. Uh, by blasting them with 60,000 or more blogger comment backlinks. So since they will rank quickly using that method, I was wondering if one was to take a more traditional approach instead so as to provide less likelihood of a future penalty and use a very limited number of good quality first tier links along with a reasonable but high number of second tier links and blast the second tier links with a third tier of 60,000 backlinks. Would the time to rank to the first page be the same or different and why? I don't know. Um, it would probably take longer to rank, and I don't know that that would work. I mean, it, it likely would, but I, I haven't tested that. So this is pure speculation. Um, and I, I every time I, without testing stuff, guys, I'm never going to get just say this is the answer because I, I don't know. I have to always preface anything that I say with you know or disclaim this is speculation, right? Um, which is what I'm doing now. I, I don't. My my guess is that it would take longer to see the effect, and I don't know that it. It would work. It probably would if you you know hit it hard enough uh, with tiered link building. But I've not tested that because here's the thing: you say um, right here where it says so as to provide less likelihood of a future penalty. I've never seen a blogger blog get penalized. Seriously, I mean, I'm not saying it can't happen. I've just never seen it. I've I've spammed the shit out of bloggers, any Google property, and I've never seen them actually penalized. Not not a single one. 
So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying I've never seen it. I want to be clear about that. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, again, I've not, I don't, I don't see the point in going through all that additional trouble, Gordon, with the blogger blog, it's blogger, it's Google, right? Spam away. The, the problem where I would say, be careful is don't do it with a branded blogger. Right. A branded blogger is different. I treat my branded assets as if they're money, they're extensions of the money site now. I really do. And I, I, I know that for years, semantic mastery, we taught the spam the shit out of the tier one at branded assets. That's what we did. I we, we just bulk or uh, uh kitchen sink spam we would throw at the what what my former partner and Rob uh used to call the SEO shield. I think they still call it that, but Branded entity assets, branded tier one assets, period. Okay. We would just spam the shit out of them. That was what we did for years and it worked. My methodology has shifted a lot in the last two years. I prefer not to use bulk spam. Um, if I'm going to use bulk spam, I only do it very strategically to do things like power up citations, business directory listings, things like that. And it's not even really to, much to power them up as it is to just help them to get crawled. And I don't even care if they index, it's just really to get them crawled. Um, so I really don't do much with bulk bulk spam at all anymore, uh, except for occasionally when I do a test on something like Blogger or you can do it with G Site still, um, patch.com classified announcement posts. Those work really well too uh, for these kind of spam gigs. You could probably still, I haven't done it in a couple of years now, but a Weebly um, could probably spam a Weebly and get the same kind of results. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is with a branded asset, though, I don't recommend doing that because I try to treat the branded assets as if they're extensions of the money site. So in that case, I would only do topically relevant links to that blogger blog, right? And then you could do additional links, like you could spam away at tier three if you wanted to. Um, but I, again, as a, a branded blogger, which would be a tier one asset, I would only do uh, topically relevant links to that if that's clear. Okay. Um, if it's a non-branded blogger, like if you're creating a supporting asset or like a persona blog or something like that, that you're going to be using just to rank that, that's not actually linking directly to any of your tier zero assets, right? So money site or Google business assets, then by all means, you can hammer away at that, right? Uh, so, but if it's a branded blogger, then something like what you're talking about up here would be the kind of the approach that I would take. That That is the approach that I take with, with all of my link building clients and my own clients. Um, this is what we do now. We, we, we basically treat all of the branded assets as if they're extensions of the money site. So we only build topically relevant links to those. Uh, and now to a lesser degree, I'm testing a little bit with doing some of the geographically relevant links to the branded assets. But for right now, I'm still focused mainly, mainly the locally relevant links. We're still pointing directly at the money site and the Google business assets. Um, I don't have enough testing uh, in um, to determine whether building locally relevant links to branded tier one assets is a good strategy or not yet. The jury's still out on that one. Okay. You say, uh, and due to the faster ranking, would it be a good idea to use Blogger as a ranking rent site? Or is there some reason that you shouldn't? No, absolutely, you can. And you can rank, again, G Site guys. Um, it's interesting. The G Site will rank better than Blogger. Blogger ranks if you optimize the pay post or page well, and then you spam it really hard. You can rank a Blogger. Um, G Sites, for whatever reason, you can rank G Sites with, with very few backlinks, but it takes a long time. So let me just see if I can demonstrate this. I, I, I'll try to see if I can give you guys an example. So I've used this example um, several times, but I, 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 let me just show you tree service, Newburgh, Kentucky. And I'll show you an example of the content mirroring method, which has a G site and a blogger, all of what you were just asking about is part of this, okay? Um, Okay, so here's some rank and rent assets that I have. So I want you guys to see something here. The first three listings for this keyword here, Tree Service Newburgh, Kentucky, or KY, are all part of a rank and rent uh, project. And then I also have the Grim Reaper Tree Services, which is another one of my assets there. So the first four listings for this particular keyword are from my own rank and rent assets. But what I'm going to point out here is the this is 
this is a high level site, a site built on high level work websites. Um, and then this is the content mirror uh, G site. Okay. And what's I don't know why the Okalona page is ranking for that. It should be the Newberg page. I don't know why, but whatever, who cares? The point that I'm trying to make here is this is the G site. And it, the, let me back up for a minute because this will make some more sense if I can show you guys the diagram. Oh, I was just in there actually, but here we go. All right. So this is the diagram of what I'm trying to demonstrate here. Okay. So the content mirroring method, as I just showed you, uh, we just showed you the Newberg page, which would be location page number two in this structure for the Louisville Felling Pro site. Okay. So then I summarized that page into a YouTube video um, and then create added that to a playlist that's optimized. And then, uh, you know, for the same kind of geographic area as the uh, money pages. And then we just embedded that into blogger post. So if we go back over here and take a look at this, you'll see it, right? We're just so you know where we're at in this G site here is the last layer in this um, content mirroring structure, right? So that's this page, right? This page right here, sub page on the G site is what we were looking at. Actually, we we're looking at the Okalona page instead of Newberg for whatever reason, that's the one that's ranking, but whatever. It's taking up a spot in the Google SERP results. I don't give a shit whether it's the right page or not. It's still taking up a spot in the search results, right? So what I'm trying to say here is if we go take a look at this, what, what is the, the same, what we're looking at here, guys, and let me get it. Let me actually go over to the Newberg page just because it'll be the right page. Here we go. So here is the blogger blog. So this is the blogger blog post. Um, Newberg, right here. This is the blogger blog post, okay? There's the video. The video is just a summary of the text from the main page, which is this, sorry, this page here. Sorry, let me move this shit around. So here we go. And we're going to put it in the process, the order in which we build this out, okay? So this is the money site page. Then we summarize that content from the money site page in the 200-ish words. Okay, and then create this video using wave.video or whatever app. It's got text to speech and everything. It's this, this is the text to speech right here. It's this, it's the same text as what's in the description. Uh, and then we create put that into a playlist. Then we create the uh, blogger blog and create a post that's optimized for tree service Newburgh, Kentucky. Right. And we embed that video. It's actually a playlist embed with that video on top of the playlist. And then the money site page. Has been embedded okay and then we got a cloud page as another option which you'd see that right here so this is the other layer this is the next layer beyond blogger it goes to a cloud page so this is the cloud page for that okay and then beyond that is the google business uh, excuse me the g site and so that's the entire content mirroring structure there now, what's interesting, and the reason I brought that up is because you were asking, can you spam a blogger? Yeah. Now, if you guys, if we were to go take a look at these guys, you'll see that there is backlinks built to this, not to this particular page, but to the Louisville Felling Pro uh, subdomain, because I did a citation vault links to that, which I never recommend pointing directly to your money site, guys. I was doing this as a test, but I have citation vault links pointing to this louisville.felling.pro. Okay, which again, I don't ever recommend pointing these directly to your money site, but this was a test. Um, and then I've got, like I said, if you were to go through and take a look at these, like shit, we'll just we'll take a look at this back. Um probably wouldn't work that way. Anyways, what I was gonna say, if we go take a look at the backlink profile, I'm not gonna do this because we're we're gonna run out of time. I won't get to all the questions, but you'll see that there's no backlinks built to this, or if there are, I didn't build them. Um, and yet we can see that we've got three number one or three positions in a row from that content mirroring structure. So why I brought that up is because, like I said, these G sites, guys, it just takes some time. You don't even have to build links to these G sites oftentimes, and you can get them to rank for lower competition terms. And there's no content on this page except for this right here. And then this right here, that's it. That's the only content on the page, guys. The rest of these are just iframes. That's why it's called the content mirroring method because you don't have to create any additional content. You just use existing content and then you just uh, repurpose that content across these other layers, if that makes sense. And that's basically what this, this is showing here is again, I got three listings in a row from that one structure 
And there's basically, if again, I'm just going to demonstrate this very quickly. If we go to Majestic, I might have to pause the screen briefly. Okay, here we go. So Louis, Louisville Falling Pro, the Newburgh, Kentucky page is ranking with zero backlinks. See that? Zero backlinks, guys. Um, and so if we were to go take a look at the G site page, which was the Okalona page, I don't know why that's that's right. It, it's odd that that's ranking for the Okalona term, but whatever. Uh, what do I care? It's still ranking. Take a look at this. Zero backlinks. You guys see that? So uh, again, I'm just showing this to you because what I'm trying to say is, you know, blogger will rank um, with an optimized page or post and in a 60,000 blog spam comments. Patch.com classified announcement posts will rank too, usually within about 30 days. Um, G sites will rank. And I see this all the time when I do this content mirroring method for lower competition terms with no backlinks at all, they will end up ranking. It just takes some time. I don't know why it takes a while for G sites to rank like that, but they do. So if you hit them with some backlinks, you can oftentimes get them to rank a lot faster and they'll stick too. And that's part of the reason why I developed this kind of process here, guys, was because if you take a look at this structure again here, all of these layers here become link building targets. So that you can really push a lot of power, which flows all the way through the structure down to the money site without ever having to build any physical links, direct links to the money site. Does that make sense? So you can get really good results this way. And your competitors oftentimes will be like, what the hell are these guys doing? Or, you know, what the hell are they doing in order to rank like this? I'm not seeing any backlinks. And so that's part of the reason why this works so well. Anyway, hopefully that makes sense. That was a long, long way to get to his, an answer to his question, but hopefully that was helpful. Next one is from Wayne. Hey guys, my SEO agency has location pages for SEO services plus city, but wondering if it's a good idea to also create pages called local SEO services plus city as well to focus on more GMBs and local clients. Or do you think this would cause issues with existing pages? I would put local SEO as a sub uh, heading within the SEO services page. You understand? So I would have a section within the SEO services pages that targets local SEO. So it would be an H2 heading, right? Um, and then you could have H3 as a supporting content within that H2 block for uh, local SEO, but that's what I would do. Because otherwise you have two pages on this, you know, you have pages on the site that are very close, um, very closely optimized, you know, very similarly optimized. And so you, you, you run, the, run the risk of potential cannibalization or uh, duplicate issues. Okay. All right. Hey, crew, what does your keyword research process look like when it comes to onboarding new SEO clients and growing keyword expansion over time? I've taken on a new e comm site with tons of products and a bit overwhelmed where to start. Do you charge for this one time or include it in your monthly retainers? Um, that's a really good question, Sam, but I don't do e comm at all, uh, SEO. So I understand when you're doing e comm, that's a whole different animal than local SEO. Um, a completely different animal. And so I, I, I really can't even begin to speak on how you would do keyword research for e-com because I can understand the complexity that that creates with as many products as you're, you know, potentially there are. It's a hell of a lot more than the services offered by a local business, right? So uh, I really can't, I'm sorry, Sam, I can't give you an answer on that at all because I don't do any e-com stuff and I, I wouldn't even know how to approach that, to be honest with you. So... Sorry, I can't answer that, guys, but I've, I try to explain to you um, on these often. I, I do local SEO, <laughs> local SEO. So I know you, I, I would love to be able to answer questions on e-com SEO, but I just don't do it. So it would be pure speculation, and I try not to do that. So Quinn's up. He says, hey, Brad, uh, hey guys, I've been running an SEO agency for a while, but price of niche edits, guest posts, et cetera, has been getting expensive for all my small local clients. It's starting to get too much for them. Why do you think I started my own link building business? Precisely for the exact reason that you just mentioned. <laughs> like no shit. I never liked building links ever. And some for some reason now I'm fascinated with it, but I never liked doing it in the past. That's why I always outsourced my entire career until the end of 2020, um, the end of 2021. 
is when I, in December is when I really started kind of learn like building my own links. And that was because of exactly what you just mentioned. Um, I was finding that the links that I was outsourcing were becoming less and less effective. So I was having to spend more and more money and I was not going back to my clients and, in, and asking for them to increase their retainer pricing because links aren't working anymore. I was just eating the cost and my margins kept shrinking. And it finally got to the point where I was damn near working for free just to maintain my clients' positions. And I said, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. I've got to figure out a better way. And um, that's how I started the journey, which ended up becoming semantic links. So anyway, trying to work out a better way to handle link building with your rebuilds. Are you adding content regularly to them? No, they're HTML sites. Um, I don't add content to them once they're built, not for the rebuilds, but we do a ton of different types of links now. Um, custom HTML rebuilds, branded entity assets, niche relevant blog links, local relevant blog links, um, press releases, citations. So we do a number of types of links, okay? Cloud pages. So we we vary our link sources now. So HTML rebuilds are static sites. Once they're deployed, they're deployed. We don't mess with them. Uh, but you know we have other types of links as well. Working out whether these are the way to go or not and plan out costs accordingly. What makes them different to a PBN? Can they also be made into many money sites so they aren't just purely for link building? Yes, you can do all of that. Um, it makes sense, especially like what I was just, guys, what I was just sharing with the local PBN stuff, man, I'm telling you, those sites will rank for local search queries. And I, I go through the training on how to use CTRify to create local blogs so that they're topic clustered blogs about whatever the topic is as it relates to that area. So you add a location modifier into the keyword that generates the content campaign for the PBN site that you're going to deploy via CTR file. This is my preferred method now for, for the local PBN sites or local blog sites, because you can take whatever the topic of the domain is and add a location modifier, and it will create a topic clustered site with 30 to 40 posts that are all entirely about that topic, but geolo uh, localized, localized that topic for that specific location. So what happens is, and, and it's basically like Q&A type, well, if you're still using the legacy type of build, which is people also ask questions and CTRFI, you can integrate with OpenAI, um, or uh, yeah, the Open a OpenAI um, API, and then it can rewrite the titles and stuff after the site is deployed, which is what I typically do. But it, it, it turns out that these local domains will end up generating local traffic too, which is amazing because that's CTR manipulation that without us manipulating, like, like that's real organic CTR um, click-through rate that, you know, occurs because these will get real local organic traffic. So very, very powerful. Um, so anyway, and, and what I'm saying with that is some of these sites, if you do what I teach, which is to add this, the sites to Search Console, you can identify by just looking at Search Console reports, the performance reports, you can identify which of your local PBN sites are actually grabbing or generating organic traffic in their own local areas. Those are the sites that then, yeah, you can monetize. You can put AdSense on those blogs and get literally just money from AdSense clicks. You could put, you could sell advertising space. Think about it. If you've got a local PBN that's generating real local organic traffic and it's getting clicks, then couldn't you sell advertising space to local businesses in that area? Of course you could. Uh, you could, you could, put CPA offers, right? Or build list, uh, build an email list if you wanted. There's a number of things that you can do with them. So um, to make them real sites to where they're not just purely for link building purposes, right? So anyway. Um, can you help us get started with your service? Yeah, I mean, you're, you can always schedule a call with me, semanticlinks.io. Um, or I just... Just I just turned my our new my new salesperson David loose today on his first sales call on his own. Um, he did it entirely on his own. So you might schedule a call. It might be somebody else that you my my, my salesperson that you talk to. But yeah, we can help you. There's no doubt we can help you get started. Anyway, moving on before we run out of time. Uh, hey, Bradley and crew, how do you? This is from Randy. How do you go about managing VAs that you charge that charge you hourly and making sure you've been? I don't pay hourly. I've got one VA that I pay hourly. That's it. 
And that's the truth. I got one VA that I pay hourly. And then I've got a couple of other VAs that are depend there. Occasionally there's certain tasks that they do that they're paid hourly, but my entire team is paid on a per task basis. It's like a network marketing model. It really is. It's um, think about it. When you pay somebody by the hour, what is their incentive to become more efficient? They don't have any. In fact, isn't their incentive the exact opposite of what you want it to be? To slow down, right? Because they're getting paid by the hour. I pay everybody on a per task basis. So they have, it, it's in their best interest to become more efficient and more productive because they can make more money. They can write their own paychecks. Um, I talked at length about this last uh, for the last mastermind webinar that I did. We, I spent an hour at least talking about how to structure and or, um, how I've structured my organization and my team and how they get paid. So um, anyway, I would encourage you to come join the mastermind if for nothing else, just for that. Okay. It says, how do you charge hourly and making sure you've been competitive but getting good profit margins on what you charge out to your clients? Again, I don't charge hourly. Why, why I like charging or paying on a per task basis is because I know exactly what my costs are. For every, every item that my team executes, I know precisely what my costs are. So I know exactly what I can charge and I know exactly what my profit margins are. When you when you pay hourly, how do you do that? I mean, maybe you guys have figured out a way. I don't care. I I, I mean, that's great if you did. I'm I'm not interested in hearing it. It's because I don't pay by the hour. But what I'm saying is, it's much more difficult to determine what your margins are when you're paying hourly. Um, but when you pay on a per task basis, you know when this item has been executed, I've had it cost me this much. Period. <laughs> right? There's no argument there. So it's really it it. And I learned that from, and this was in the presentation. I talked about this at the end of our um, my my presentation at SEO at the Beach. But right here, this book, No BS, uh, this is Dan Kennedy, the No BS book series, uh, Ruthless Management of People and Profits. Go buy that book or buy the audio book. Listen to it, read it, whatever. That book right there will change your business. Um, it did for me. And that's where I, like once I've read that, and I listened to it first and then I read it. Um, so I've both listened to it and read it. That book right there changed my business. It really taught me the importance of understanding your margins. Um, and that's why I switched entirely to a task-based payment system or compensation plan because of that reason. And it's it made my, my business uh, much more profitable too. And my entire team is incredibly loyal and they're super happy because they make so much more money than they could if they were being paid by the hour. I can pay my team members $6 an hour and they're in the Philippines, or I can pay them $60 an hour because they're producing for me on a per task basis. And that's literally what they make. I mean, I'm not kidding. The My, my team makes a ton of money and they're incredibly loyal and very appreciative of it. Um, and it's great because I, again, my I actually became more profitable when I started paying on a per task basis. So anyway. A fan of the task model that Braddock suggests for VAs, but I also do software development. I found it very hard as all developers want hourly rates. Yeah, I can't speak on that just because I don't have any kind of team members that are like that. Um, so I really don't know what to say. Maybe Adam or Chris, do you guys have any milestones for software developers? So you basically, instead of tasks, you basically have to find milestones and you pay them for that. Adam? <laughs> Yeah, I would just say kind of classic management, right? And maybe promote a team leader from within as soon as you can. Like I have people that do stuff um, more on the creative side. And so for them, I could probably get it down to a piecework, um, but I haven't had the need, nor do I particularly want to. Um, so for them, it's just making sure that, you know, costs are in line and then having someone else manage them wherever possible. Yeah, and I I just hired a software developer to build a link building app for me. Um, it's a reporting app. Um, anyway, um, and that's that's how we've structured that, and that was with some support and help from Jeremy Notzelman from Press Advantage, uh, because I've never hired a, a developer and managed that myself. And so Jeremy offered very graciously to to help guide me with that, and he actually found the developer for me and everything. And I just hired him, and that's what we're doing. I am paying him by the hour, um, but exactly what. Chris just mentioned a moment ago, which is setting milestones. So that's like how we judge the performance um, and everything is based on milestones. And then that's when he gets paid too, is, is when certain milestones are set so or met, excuse me. So 
Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that. So that's just why I can't, sorry, Randy, I can't give you a better idea on that. Like I said, I just switched everything over to task base and um, I'm so grateful that I did. So John says, how do some of these big SEO agents manage to charge like 15,000 per month with cookie cutter type SEO packages that are all generic deliverables and stuff like 50 target keywords, 20 links, et cetera? Uh, because they probably are targeting larger companies that, you know, have the bigger, deeper pockets and don't analyze that stuff as much. Remember, a lot of them, like my client base uh, for my own like local SEO agency are very small tree service contractors, very small companies. Those are the ones that monitor every freaking penny that goes out the door. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, think about it. I, I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, but when you deal with medium size or larger companies, you typically have a lot less hand-holding, a lot less um, questions to answer, a lot fewer questions to answer, if that makes sense. Like what I'm saying is generally the larger companies are easier to work with because, because to them they have, it's not, you know, what when you're dealing with a small business that isn't making a whole lot of money. Um, and oftentimes I think a lot of us in the SEO world do that. We, we work with the uh, smaller companies and they're the ones that are penny pinchers. And they're the ones that look at marketing as an expense, not an investment, or that does, they don't they don't see it as providing a return. Many of them don't. And so, whenever there's any kind of struggle financially for their business, what's the one thing that they always want to blame it on? The marketer, right? They want to cut the marketing or SEO expense, which they don't like. I always thought that was dumb because it's like you need sales. Well, how do you get the sales through marketing? Hey, right? so if you're not marketing, how do you get the sales? So it's like the chicken and the egg type thing or cart and horse type thing, whatever. Um, so uh, I think probably some of these big SEO agencies are typically, plus they do volume, right? They just um, spam the shit out of uh, with email spam or phone spam. Um, and they just get poor unsuspecting business owners to agree that have no idea and don't know any better. And there's a lot of churn with a lot of these big companies too, these big marketing agencies, because they take some on some poor sap small business owner that pays them for six months expecting results and they don't get ever any results. And then they cancel and they don't, the big companies don't care because they just keep filling their pipeline with new leads. Right. But the small company now is jaded because now they're butt hurt that they got their money taken for six months and never had any results. So now they're suspect of you an actual skilled SEO when you reach out and say, Hey, I can help you. So that's the industry that we're in. Um, if you work with larger companies, you typically don't have those kind of problems. Sometimes you do, but mo most, I mean, I, in my experience, the larger companies typically require less uh, demand of my time, my own personal attention. So now that is to say, though, my industry, my own local SEO agency deals with tree service contractors and the small companies. I don't deal with the large tree service companies. So um, it's, it, you know, it is what it is. It's just, that's just the industry that I'm in. So. Anyway, Lucas says, hey, SM, when it comes to reputation management, do you know of any good white label services you can uh, to help clean up fake Google reviews for client? No, not fake Google reviews. I, I know somebody said some, I'd have to find it and I don't know where it is. Honestly, it would take me probably 10 minutes to find it if I could even find it. I know somebody had mentioned somewhere that there was a service that does that, but I don't, I didn't save it or keep it. So no, I'm sorry, I don't know of one. I broadcast to my channel. Yeah, I'm looking at the page right now. I just looked at the thing and I was like, oh, right. It's Bradley Benner page. If you look at the icon below the play, like up right there, right there, look at the logo. It's not Semantic Mastery. No, but I chose the Semantic Mastery channel. I'm no, curious no. now. I'm oh, curious. Man. Shut up. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Anyways, yeah, it's all good. Okay. Well, whatever. Moving on. Um, all right. Using CTR tool like SE. I'm not sure. Oh, Serp Empire probably. I haven't tested this tool yet. It takes the hassle out of figuring out search volume for your targeted keyword. But how do you establish how much branded searches should you use using CTR? Uh, because if it integrates with Search Console, 
It's all you should if you already have branded searches, then it's going to pull that in. Um, so anyway, I don't I don't know if that makes sense or not. If you're integrating with search with Search Console to allow the kind of auto discovery or keyword magic or whatever the hell it is that they call in there, that it pulls in the search queries and the URLs and their positioning and it, and it modifies or manipulates the search and click volume based on its current positioning. Um, and so essentially, and it, it's supposed to auto optimize. So as it improves in positioning, it can increase in volume as well. Uh, so it's going to pull in branded search queries and manipulate or modify the campaign um, based upon its current search query volume. Now, here's something you can do, though. You can have a search console campaign set up. So the keyword magic or auto discovery or whatever it's called uh, for your branded searches and for whatever data is in search console. OK, so, so you set up one campaign for that. But then if you want to add additional brand searches, search and clicks. Then you would add a second campaign and do that manually, where you can go in and add some more kind of search and clicks um, for branded searches and variations of it, right? We call navigational search queries. So brand name, the variations of the brand name, brand name plus phone number, brand name. And I don't mean like brand name plus the actual company's phone number, but like Brad's tree service phone. Like what is the phone number? Do you understand? Like it's to go to, uh, we're going to run out of time, but what I mean here is like, um, searching Google for, let's say, Louisville Felling Pro phone number. This is what I mean, right? Something like that. Those are the types of searching clicks, uh, searching clicks that are called navigational search queries or branded searches. Um, company name, hours of operation, company name, business hours, company name, jobs, company name, products, company name, services, right? Those are all types of search, branded search queries that you can add to a manual campaign to kind of uh, augment or supplement a search and click campaign that's um, from search, search console data. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, Cecilia, what's up, Cecilia? She says, when trying to create photos for GMB posts, is there any sort of penalty cost risk associated with using stock photos? Yeah, from what I understand, yeah. And I know that I've had photos rejected that were stock photos. Um, even after adding a logo to the photo, I assume Google recognized it as a stock photo from elsewhere and in use by potentially other businesses somewhere else. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, we, as you know, Cecilia, I always do a, a logo overlay and a QR code overlay now. Um, but yeah, I mean, st it's always better to use original photos for sure. Other side of the coin, taking screenshots from topical YouTube videos to create photos for GMB posts. Any benefit over stock photos? Yeah, I like that because they're unique. Um, if you take screenshots from YouTube videos, um, they're they're going to be unique images. I, you know, I for years that's all I did. I don't do it now because it's a scaling issue. It's very difficult to scale that. Um, but yeah, that's a good option. The cons of the screenshot is the quality isn't great. Yeah, but I've showed how to do that before. Uh, let's just very quickly, we're going to go over a minute or two guys. I hope it's all right. If you guys got to go, go, um, I want to go to YouTube, but I go to YouTube. All right. So let's just do an example. So say tree removal. What I always do is go up here and go to filters and I go to HD, or you can even go to 4k now, but that might limit your results. Uh, but always add like an HD filter. And then when you click into it, I'm going to pause it or at least turn the audio off. Um, then what I always do is I make sure that it's set to the highest quality resolution. And then I do the theater mode like that. And then I'll take the screenshot. So let's just find a spot. Let's, let's just use that right there. Okay. I'm going to go take a screenshot if I can get snag it to work. Um, there we go. So I take a screenshot of like this area. So it's big. And then I shrink it down to an appropriate size. And that makes the resolution seem a lot sharper. So like 600 by 400 ish would be something, you know, somewhere around there. But that becomes a much more um, sharper image. Is that is that clear? Like, that's just one way to do it. I don't know why it looks so damn small. It looks. That's that's not that's. 
That's wider than 600 images. You know, I did a PC update and I swear my resolution looks weird. <laughs> like everything looks smaller. So I don't know if it updated like my video driver or something, but everything does look smaller, font and everything. So I'm going to have to figure out what happened. Anyway. Higher resolution? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I just did it in a PC update and everything, everything's smaller now, like text and everything. So got to figure out what happened. Uh, yeah, I agree. Like, so that's what I said that the, the, the screenshot issue was a scaling thing, which is why I've switched back to using stock photos again recently, just because it's just a scaling issue. I always have to task my, I got a VA that I tasked for that. And I said like, Hey, I need a hundred free service images. And he'll two days later, he'll send me a hundred tree service images that he scraped from YouTube, but it, it takes forever. So. Okay, guys, a couple of comments and then I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, Anselmo says, is Moz topical trust flow? Well, Moz doesn't do trust flow. Moz is page authority, domain authority. So he must be talking about Majestic. Is Majestic topical trust flow a good way to find domains from the same niche? No, not necessarily. To topical trust flow is not perfect, guys. There's flaws to it as well. Um, and remember, topical trust flow doesn't doesn't indicate what the topic of the site is it indicates what the topical categories of the backlink profile are that are pointing to the site do you understand so that can be completely wrong I'm not saying majestic is wrong but what i'm saying is uh, like for example a tree service site if i have a local attorney that we like a tree service contractor or one of my lead gen sites or whatever takes a tree down in a local attorney's parking lot because there was a tree that was needed that was dying and needed to come down. They take a tree down and a local attorney put uh, thanks, does a blog post, thank you, a thank you blog post that they publish to their blog that has a link to the my tree service site. And they the attorney sites generally have very strong backlink profiles and it should be in the appropriate category, which would be society slash law. And so I will get a link from a local site that has a high trust flow in society slash law topical trust flow category. That will help my GMB or Google business profile to rank because it's a local link from a local attorney, but it's in an, the wrong topical category, right? An irrelevant topical category. And so, but now the backlink profile for my tree service site is likely going to show society slash law as a significant topical trust flow. Um, uh, significant amount of the topical trust flow will be in society slash law, which is not appropriate. So I, what I'm saying is do not look at the, the topical trust flow that is at, um, flowing into a domain as an indication of what the topic of that domain is. That's absolutely wrong. You have to look at the um, the topical trust flow of the, the backlink profile. Uh, I mean, you still have to analyze the domain that it's linking to to determine what is appropriate. I don't know if that's clear or not, but you say, I thank you for your reply. So um, would you say that geo-relevant links are more I already covered that? Okay, that's it. Got it. Sweet. All right. Beautiful. We're wrapped up. We'll see you guys next week. Mastermind webinar tomorrow, by the way, guys. For those of you that are in the Mastermind, 3.30 p.m.